I'm very excited to kick this off. Uh, I think you might already be able to see some, if not all of our panelists, but we're giving you a little quick intro. I'm calling in from Germany. My name is Marie and I'm one of the lucky co-founders of All Living Things Environmental um, Film Festival. And Kunal, where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from Panchkani, um, the home of All Living Things Environmental Film Festival. And I am also one of the co-founders of, of the festival. And so I want to welcome everyone to the official launch of All Living Things Environmental Film Festival, or ALT-F, as we like to call it. Um, today we have attendees from around the globe. Uh, I think we are representing, you're representing almost 12 countries, if not more. Um, and I'm super excited to be here today. Um, I, I really want to start with uh, saying that ALTEF is coming to reality with the help of an international team of 12 very dedicated volunteers. And I really want to thank them for making all of this possible. Um, we work remotely from Goa, Bangalore, uh, Panchkani, Mumbai, Germany, and the UK as well. And we all come together for a mission is, which is to engage the public on the environmental and social issues of our time through an informed, creative, and an experiential discourse. ALTEF, through the films, which will include but not limited to topics such as climate change and biodiversity, mitigation, migration, human migration, climate change mitigation, food systems, sustainability, conservation, social justice, uh, among a few, and the ideas exchanged and the activities undertaken. Um, we want to showcase the beauty of the planet and we want to create awareness about the critical issues and inspire viewers to envision and shape our possible futures. The home of the festival is our beautiful hill station town called Panchkani, which is in the state of Maharashtra near Mumbai. Um, I'm kind of, I'm sitting here right now so I can give you a little how it looks right here. We are, we should be in the middle of monsoon season, but uh, rains are not here at the moment. So this is the home of All Living Things Environmental Film Festival. Um, it is in the Western Ghats mountain range, uh, which is a world heritage site and one of the eight biological hotspots of the world. Uh, and Panchkani was actually named the cleanest town in India for a couple of years in a row. And there's an excellent community here. And this film festival is a part of a greater and larger vision that many of us share to make Panchkani a hub for sustainable tourism, education, and education on climate change and regenerative solutions. So that was a bit of intro. We are also currently taking film submissions um, which the deadline is the 15th of September and we will encourage um, you guys to follow us on our social media channels and check out our website. Um, on to you, Marie. Awesome, thank you. I uh, wish I could be there in Panchkini right now, but maybe another time. Um, <laughs> but you're here to be at the launch event and we themed it all about coral, not just because we think corals are amazing. For example, did you know they're animals? They're not plants. Fun fact, and you will hear more fun facts soon. Um, but also because reefs are pretty much the rainforest of the sea and they play an integral part in any conversation about how to sustain the health of our planet. So we're super thrilled to welcome a panel of filmmakers and scientists and advocates who are dedicating their lives to bringing awareness to reefs, their function and wonders including the ones in India and also the Gulf of Manara reefs, which are featured in the documentary we're making available today, Coral Woman. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to our facilitator, Dr. Serene Barucha, who's an environmental social scientist at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge. So calling in from the UK and her course research focus is on environmental change and how people cope with it, mainly in India. So Serene, over to you. Thank you, Marie, and thank you, Kunal. And like Marie, I'm really jealous of where you're sitting and I wish I was in Panchkani. Um, and I'm looking forward to traveling back home to India soon. But I'm joining you right now from the little Suffolk town of um, Bury St. Edmunds. And I'm really thrilled to be here. And I'm so happy that we've got people from around the world um, joining us to discuss these fast fascinating topics of like environmental change and how to live well and sustainability. Um, today, I think it's really, really great that we're kicking off the film festival discussing corals. Um, corals are a very iconic, very charismatic, but we don't know a lot about them. Um, and we don't really discuss them, I think, as much as we should when we think about 
environmental change and environmental sustainability. And um, we'll be focusing on two really, really beautiful, profoundly moving films, um, Chasing Coral, which is directed by Jeff Orlovsky, um, and that was released in 2017 and won uh, an Emmy. It follows a group of divers and photographers and scientists as they attempt to film a coral bleaching event in 2016 for the first time and really show in really stark detail before and after what reefs look like um, after a bleaching event. Um, the film is incredibly visually arresting, but it is also profoundly moving and has a really unique emotional uh, charge. And almost every single reviewer has picked up on that unique aspect of the film. And the same thing can really be said in terms of the emotional content and the visual kind of the, the stunning visuals combined with the emotions um, in Coral Woman, which was directed by Priya Thubiseri and released in 2019, so just last year, so it's still very new. Um, Coral Woman follows this amazing um, journey of um, a lady called Uma Mani who learned to swim and then dive and paint in her late 40s and early 50s because she was so struck by uh, the beauty of the corals and it follows her journey diving and learning about um, India's reefs and some of the threats and challenges that are facing our marine spaces. We've got four amazing panelists to talk about these films but also about the issues of environmental change in marine spaces and particularly with reef ecosystems. It's a real honor to have them uh, between them. They've got decades and decades and decades and decades of experience um, and some amazing um, stories and adventures to share. So we've got uh, Priya Thubaseri, who, as I mentioned, is director for Coral Woman. She's an award-winning independent filmmaker based in New Delhi, and most of her work focuses primarily on women and gender, but she is currently also working on a series of films on climate change. We've got Anupama Mandloy, who is the impact producer for Coral Women, um, which is a really unique and wonderful role, um, which I'm looking forward to exploring um, in some of the questions. And I think some people in the audience will be particularly interested in how there's this unique kind of movement developing and in, in, in increasing the impact of these beautiful films. So we'll hear more about that from Anupama. She's a very highly regarded television professional with a career spanning 15 years and she's just made her debut as a producer with A Boy and a Dog Productions. We've also got James, Jim Porter, um, who's featured in Chasing Coral. Um, Jim is the Josiah Meggs Professor of Ecology at the University of Georgia, and he specializes in the ecology and biology of coral reefs. Um, his work as an environmental educator has been recognized by the Eugene Odom Award for Environmental Education. He is He's also an award-winning photographer and his photos have um, appeared in Life magazine and the New York Times and his work has been profiled very widely um, in very major media platforms. And finally, but no means the least, we've got Tara Jain. She is executive director for Reef Watch Marine Conservation. Um, and her journey started as a scuba diving instructor in the um, luxury and Andaman Islands and she was inspired so much by the beauty of the ocean, but also so struck by the degradation of these marine spaces. She left to learn more about marine biodiversity um, at the Scripps Institute for Oceanography in San Diego. She's now back, um, she's heading Reef Watch and she's engaged in some really fascinating uh, pioneering work in conserving India's marine spaces. So before I begin, I just wanna say a big thank you um, to the panel for taking the time. What we're going to do is, I think we're going to spend about 30 minutes just having a conversation about coral reefs and about the two films. Um, and then we're going to take audience questions for between 15 and 20 minutes, depending on how we go with the time. Um, 
you can send in your questions at any time, but it would be good when you do that to make sure that you send us your name uh, and also where you're joining us from. And if your question is for a particular um, panel member, then just let us know that as well so I can direct the questions. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, before we get into the films, I think it would be really good for people who are joining who have seen the, um, the films to just understand what corals are and why they are so special and unique as life forms. So Tara, could I ask you to explain that? Yeah, sure. So um, hello, everyone. Uh, so just getting right into it, what are corals? Um, if you imagine a small animal, a bit like uh, very closely related to a jellyfish, uh, kind of upside down in the water with the same uh, stinging uh, tentacles that jellyfish have. Um, and now this little soft bodied animal basically uh, takes calcium and carbonate ions from the water and puts it down almost like a rock like structure underneath it. And that's what grows into these, uh, you know, coral uh, animals and then and then reefs. Um, and then the way that they power themselves, the way that they get the energy to do this uh, pretty energy intensive task is a, they have small plant cells like algal cells in their tissue. Uh, which uh, I remember uh, Chasing Coral described as uh, as food factories, which I thought was a great way of saying it. Um, so these small algal cells basically photosynthesize inside the clear tissue of the animal um, and give it the energy to uh, to grow these reefs. Um, and the other way is that, uh, you know, at night that when there is no sunlight, the tentacles themselves come out and feed on small plankton that's passing by. Um, so what, what makes these animals so amazing? Firstly, each one of these animals is tiny, right? Like uh, a few millimeters big at most. Uh, but then together with, you know, with clones of itself, they grow these huge reefs, which um, I believe are the biggest thing to have ever been built by any living creature, including humans, bigger than the Great Wall of China. Uh, so basically it's, a, you know, the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and for me, my favorite, why I think that corals are so important as well as so beautiful is that even though they cover less than 1% of the ocean surface, uh, they are home to about a quarter of all marine life. Um, so you can just imagine them as these thriving havens of biodiversity. Um, and that is what a coral and a coral reef is. I hope that was clear. That was amazing. Thank you. I think what's really, what's really fascinating to me as someone who didn't know a lot about corals before was this amazing symbiosis with the plant cells being inside and really helping the coral animal to live. And that brings me to my next question for, for Jim, which is, can you, you coral bleaching is and why it matters? Yes, well, the magic, uh, as Naya said, is in that symbiosis between the algae and the animal. But the irony is corals are tropical. You'd think, well, why would heat be a problem for them? But only one or two degrees centigrade above their summertime temperature kills the algae. And when the algae die, all the fats, oils, and sugars, and starches that the alga gives to the coral stop flowing, and the coral starves to death. So coral's color doesn't come from animal pigments. It comes from plant pigments, chlorophylls, xanthophylls. So when the algae die, the, uh, they go away. And you can see right through the clear flesh of the animal to the white limestone skeleton underneath. That's called coral bleaching. And what we're so afraid of is that as global warming raises the temperature, more of these algae will die and the reef will die. Thanks, great. So I think one thing that, I mean, for people who did see um, Chasing Coral already, something that is really difficult to understand is when you have a bleached reef, this whole colorful ecosystem suddenly becomes this glittering white. I mean, it is a desert because the coral's in, in deep trouble. And that means, as I, if I understand you correctly, all the plant cells have left the coral and the coral is slowly 
uh, starving to death. But there was this really amazing scene in Chasing Coral where the divers look at a reef which is fluorescing. So before turning white, it turns all these amazing highlighter colors like pink and purple and, and yellow. So what's happening there? Those colors uh, are produced by the coral as a last attempt to prevent being sunburned because mm -hmm. those colors absorb ultraviolet light. So not only is the temperature killing them, but the UV light can kill them as well. And it's the last gasp before death. I mean, it's quite beautiful really, but it's, it's quite tragic in a way. I mean, when I saw that, I thought that can't really be a good sign. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, so once the coral dies, everything that's depending on the reef also begins to get into trouble. I wondered if Tara, you could tell us a little bit about what, what the loss of coral reefs would mean for, I mean, obviously it's a great tragedy for the, the local ecology, but what would it mean for people who depend on the reefs as well? Yeah, so as I kind of uh, briefly mentioned before, uh, you know, so much of marine biodiversity is dependent on coral reefs. Um, this is kind of because the coral reefs are like are a structure, right? They're a structure in the middle of this vast sandy bed that is the ocean. And this structure gives space for small fish to come and hide, small boring animals to bore into the coral and you know, um, find shelter. Larger animals then come to feed on these animals. And now a lot of uh, this kind of bustling metropolis that, that is a coral reef are also uh, fish that, um, you know, that are commercially fished, that are eaten by uh, a lot of both coastal as well as mainland, um, you know, people uh, that are fished by, by fishermen who are completely uh, dependent on the reef. Uh, but further, since a lot of these corals, um, you know, in India, two of the major places where we have coral reefs, which is Lakshadweep and Andamans are small island um, spaces that are quite uh, susceptible to things like, you know, large tsunamis, but also through an, to an increasing sort of extreme weather uh, phenomena that is happening, you know, which is another sort of impact of climate change. We're seeing more storms, cyclones at, you know, different times of the year. And all of this obviously impacts people that live on those islands through, uh, you know, their property being destroyed to the islands themselves getting eroded away over time, which was also mentioned in Coral Woman. So, um, you know, to say that, I mean, because we are all, we're so interlinked and we don't, I mean, even though in India, I feel especially we're not as aware of just how much we depend on the ocean and just how much we get from the ocean, but that doesn't stop the fact from being true. And so anything that's happening in the oceans, and especially when we're talking about like a large uh, sort of foundational species like corals, uh, going extinct or or getting you know shattered beyond um you know beyond repair then that's going to have and is having a huge impact on the lives of our coastal people thank you i think that's great and you brought me on to what i wanted to start out with so let's let's just get into the films a little bit and i'm going to start with um chasing coral just because we just talked about bleaching so um, am I right, Jim, when I say that chasing coral is the first time that we have captured a mass bleaching event in this way? Yes, it is. It was very unique. You know, you would think that something so important um, would have been filmed before. We had a lot of after pictures where the reef had turned white and people came in and photographed it, but never the process. And that's the key. And this film festival that you have hosted um, highlights. You need to not tell people, you need to show them. Sure. And, and so just going back to the photo. So if I, I understood correctly from the film, um, Coral reef biologists and ecologists have been taking photos of bleached reefs and these kind of, you know, it's almost like a city just going quiet and dead. Um, but then what does the video add, do you think? What does capturing it in this way add? The video adds life. Yeah. 
you see the process of death firsthand. Your eyes cannot turn away from the time lapse as you see the most beautiful structure in the world disappear before your very eyes. And just to take a step back, I don't think we covered it. You've, you explained really well what the bleaching is, but what's really evident in chasing corals is, is that these are mass events. So can you talk about the scale? It's not like little bits of coral going white. What's right. a mass bleaching event? Right, that's the other thing the film did. It highlighted that this was a worldwide phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, prior to this, one reef would have a tragedy, another reef would have a tragedy, and people would learn about that. But in the film, there's a scene where we do crowdsourcing, where we have people teleconference from all over the world, from every country that has a coral reef. And we see, and the audience sees, that this is not just a local tragedy, this is a global tragedy and therefore a human tragedy. Mm, that's a good point. I think um, with Coral Woman as well, the first um, scene, Priya, is um, one of the first scenes quite early in the film is when Uma is diving for the first time. So I think she learned to dive in the Maldives that's correct, uh, where her husband was based as a doctor. And then the opening of the film is when she moves back to India and she's in Kode Canal. Um, and she and you are having an exchange and she says that she'd like to start with her first dive in India in the Gulf of Manar. And the first thing that she sees is that the water is beautiful, it's all really blue, um, but she says it's just like a desert because it's a dead, it's a dead reef. So the coral has gone from the color to the white, and then there's, it's dead. There's a lot of algae just growing on it. Um, it's rotting, essentially. Um, but then something that is also really clear from Coral Woman is that it's not just bleaching um, that's causing um, the loss of corals. One of the first things that you showed is that there's been a lot of extraction. Like people have been using corals for construction, um, which is, which is like really, <laughs> you wouldn't think that that's the case because they seem like such delicate animals, but here there are buildings made out of coral. So I just want to ask you, um, Priya, like um, going on this journey to notice um, all of these threats with Uma, can you tell us how that started um, and tell us a little bit about your journey to making that film with her? Uh, I am not a diver like Nayantara or a researcher like James, um, but I'm a storyteller, I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I fall in love with stories and that's how most of my films happen. But uh, not even in my dreams, I thought that I will be making a film like Coral Woman, which is about corals and, you know, and I was like most of the people in my audience who thought that I don't have anything to do with corals. Okay, even if corals are dying, so what? So this was how I was like few years back. And uh, it was my first, first, first my love was with Uma, how a coral, a beautiful animal, which inspired somebody to do this huge plunge, you know, uh, to learn deep sea diving and also uh, swimming. And, and that too at this age. Uh, so that really inspired me. And through her, through her paintings, I also started loving corals. Uh, like our friendship continued for almost two years. It was a very accidental meeting and um, uh, over internet and WhatsApp and everything, we started chatting. And she repeatedly shared her paintings and I started reading about corals. And uh, more I read about it, I got the seriousness about it. And I felt that uh, there is a lot happening in our coast also. Uh, there is like wonderful activities which is happening in Andamans and Lakshadweep. Uh, so even if you Google search, you will you will see a lot happening there. But uh, when I when I found that there are corals in Tamil Nadu, Gulf of Manar is one of the many national parks in India. I felt that there is very little done from it. And as a storyteller, I felt that there's a very nice connection. Like a, I can weave a story of Uma coming from Tamil Nadu and uh, her making her first Indian uh, like plunge into the sea. And what will she see? So that's how the narrative actually built. And for me, uh, it was a journey with her. I wouldn't have taken this uh, journey. If it was not like my first love was not her. Uh, then the corals. And, but 
though the film started as a personal story i felt that it's not just about that there is a lot happening there like you mentioned the coral mining uh, for me that coast be- became so popular it, be- it is one of the most busy sports in india it became so busy because of its diversity there there were pearls there were corals you know portuguese and dutch people everybody came to that coast because of its uh, vastness uh and there is connection with sea rail everything and then people started building industries and people started needed buildings and everything and corals were so plenty there they started building the houses using corals or godowns using corals so even if you now even now when you make a walk through that coast you will see churches made of corals mm. so that was quite painful now uh, but now coral mining is completely stopped at least legally uh but there is a lot which already it is happening there because it's now a industrial hub uh there is quite a lot of gap between awareness and education so so that made me feel that you know that we i can actually focus on just well for manar and tell the story i think so we are i'm going to just touch a little bit on like what making the films like both of the films what kind of awareness have they generated what have you learned about the process of making films about environmental change but one thing that i just thought would be good to hear from tara so in coral woman we hear some really fascinating things about the threats to corals beyond bleaching and we know that they're already vulnerable to bleaching but there was a lot of other things um you know not just the the mining but the fact that the reefs are very vulnerable to pollution they're vulnerable to invasive species like the exotic seaweed that is used to get the carrageenan that is used in uh, some very popular beverages so can you talk a little bit tara about what unique threats um our indian marine spaces and particularly those reefs are facing yeah so um so like uh, it has been touched upon uh, while global warming and climate change is this sort of large uh, you know global level threat really that corals everywhere are facing um, there's also a lot of local level stressors that corals can face so you know corals actually exist in a very uh, like like a very intricate balance of sea water right so the sea water that they live in has to not only be in a particular temperature range but it's also uh, you know it has to be low nutrient waters for instance so warm waters tend to be uh, lower nu- have lower nutrients than um, you know than colder water and because we're in the tropics that's that's the case with us um, and how this warm uh, how this low nutrient helps them is that it um, stops their competitors which are these macro algae which were shown in the film these big red sort of um you know and uh and that from growing and smothering these corals or like the the uh, pepsi algae i believe they called it in in yeah, yeah. um so how how those sort of grew over so they and then again remembering that they need uh, sunlight as well right because they have algal cells that photosynthesize so any sort of um anything that that mucks up the water right so if you have a lot of say even like what i've noticed in the andamans is places where they've allowed uh, jet skis you know because jet skis have this like strong force of water that they also send down and that kind of lifts up all the sand and silt which then comes and settles on top of the coral stopping it from getting sunlight so now that's a very kind of local level stress or that's happening here uh nutrients being added to the water through things like untreated sewage um you know now that 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 what that does is just like when you add nutrients uh you know onto soil you start getting a lot of sort of plants growing there so similarly you get these like algal blooms and growths that that can happen when sewage comes in and that's something that's happening uh you know all over the andamans not just of course in manar like we saw in the film but also in the andamans anywhere where tourism starts to pick up you know then all of these things uh start to happen another thing is like very destructive fishing practices such as bottom trawling you know when you have a huge beam that's scraping the seabed and just picking up everything in this net behind it that happens to come in the way then you have all sorts of corals um you know being trapped there in fact i mean i think most of before you know 
diving and stuff has quite recently picked up in India even, but most of our older marine biologists all studied corals through um, finding them in trawl garbage, you know, so in trawl bycatch, um, so which I think is such a tragedy. Imagine the, you know, I can't imagine having been a marine biologist at that time and studying these things that had already died, uh, you know. So, so that's um, so. Those are some of the the sort of local level uh, threats: pollution, uh, untreated sewage, a lot of physical damage, um, and uh, you know, unsustainable uh, tourism activities. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is, um, in the next five minutes, we're going to open up the floor for questions from the audience. So if you have any particular questions for particular audience members, please feel free to start putting them um, in the chat. And while you're doing that, I just want to talk a little bit about what sort of impact um, these films have made. They're, they're tremendously impactful and both of them have an agenda to raise awareness. So Anupam, um, can I start with you and can you tell me a little bit about this unique role um, of impact producer for Coral Woman and what your plans are? And I believe you're going to share your screen as well. There's a short PowerPoint. So I just invite you to do that as well. So you'd like me to, to start? No, if, if Anupama could just uh, yes. start with, yeah. So basically for me, I'm very new to this journey. Uh, I met Priya at uh, Good Pitch Lab, and that's where I sort of came across this world of uh, content creation, which is related to things that are happening in the world around us. And so the content creator in me and the activist in me got this opportunity to marry the two and become an impact producer. And I realized that this role is actually very, uh, it's not even been explored much in India. And I thought this is a great opportunity for me and then, of course, Priya is so inspiring in the way she completely commits herself to a cause. And I thought this is a fantastic partner and it's a great film for me to be associated with. So here, uh, the film actually has been going and making the rounds for a while now. Uh, but parallelly, we've been creating an impact plan uh, where we, during Good Pitch, Pitch Lab, we had a lot of partners come on board. And it's been fantastic how they've actually completely wholeheartedly committed themselves to helping us uh, realize some of our dreams uh, of creating awareness through education. So if you want, I could possibly share that uh, now. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we've got a couple of minutes. Great. So yeah. Basically, what we want to do is that we've realized that with kids and the youth, they are the ones who are the most uh, open to sort of a, so understanding the situation and wanting to do something about it. So what we want to do is create youth ambassadors. And we have a three-way three, three -way route of doing it. One is through our website, which we have a functional website in place now, thanks to one of our partners. Uh, but there is a lot that needs to be done to make that uh, website fully functional. So I'll take you through that. And then we are looking at an underwater art installation and an illustrated book, all done through creating a community of people who will carry this forward. So, and again, because it's impact producer, it's movie to movement. And, uh, and so we'll start with the learning portal, which is our uh, website. In over there, we have the documentary for one thing, which is going to sort of be accessible to anybody who wants it to uh, impart education and awareness, whether it is to students or to colleges and schools. Uh, we want to create a virtual toolkit, which is an immersive learning experience for kids um, with a lot of interactivity built into it, uh, because we realize that that's the way the kids tend to uh, sort of get deeperly, uh, better involved with uh, the issues. The other thing is uh, community level engagement, which is using coral enthusiasts and divers to share the experiences with us. Uh, and all of this, like the pieces of the puzzle that we need for us to come together, for us to realize this, is the toolkit, the coral book, and the digital art exhibits, which are actually Uma Mani's paintings, where uh, I'm sure if all of you have seen the film, she started painting before she started diving. And now mm -hmm. her paintings have become really, really um, very finished. 
So we're going to use the website as a, as a portal to host her exhibits. And all of that tied in with fundraising. So whatever money we generate through this website, we want to roll it back into coral rehabilitation. So that's really uh, one of our goals. The other is creating an underwater art installation, which is eco-friendly. Uh, we'd like to create an art residency with five or six artists uh, who are established, coming from different forms of art, where they'll come together for one month and come up with hopefully a really uh, unique installation that we would then place underwater. Uh, and we've already identified a resort where they are willing to sort of open their uh, resort to us and set it up there. So the world of coral impact for us basically is the students, the parents and educators, the artists and the coral community, all coming together to make this possible. It's wonderful. And we have a three year impact roadmap. The first year would be just to launch the platform, which as I just told you is a functional website already. And the children's book, which is already underway. So we've got the script locked in. We just need to sort of uh, move on that. And the educational toolkit and art installation the second year, because we need to get a research team and, and there is a lot of uh, work that would need to go into it. Also parallelly, sort of getting the policy makers to come on board and give us their support uh, by creating restricted zones and by helping us with PR and word of mouth to help make this a larger than you know, life event. So basically, immediately what we're doing is we're looking for fundraising, we're looking at formulating a team, digital development of the website and initiating the uh, residency. How can anyone support any in any way possible, whether it is through funds or whether it is through resources, through just collaboration, anything and everything is welcome because for us, this is a very new journey and we have a very long way to go. So the more the merrier and all help is welcome. And these are our partners who've sort of come on board completely committed to helping us realize our dream. So that's, that's really where we are at with our impact plans. Brilliant, thank you Anupama. I'm just going to, before we open it up to questions, um, we've already got a question, couple of questions on the future of Reef. So I'm going to, I'm going to park what I was going to say about that. But um, Jim, I just want you um, to share what you have about the reefs after um, making Chasing Coral. And you're going to share your screen as well. So I just invite you to do that. Let me try and share the screen here. There we go. Share. Okay, as you know, I was chief scientist and a principal cast member uh, for Chasing Coral. And what we wanted to do after the film was in the can was to go back to the reefs in Jamaica that we had photographed um, almost uh, 40 years ago. And we had used still life camera and I'm going to show you what they looked like before. This is the coral reef in Jamaica before and now slowly we montage across it and that's after. Now the viewing audience has the right and I would say the responsibility to ask, are you really in the same place? It doesn't look the same at all. So I draw your attention to this coral head in the, in the lower right hand part there with a donut hole in it. And there we see before and after we are in the same place. And the reason for this loss is global climate change, global warming, and the coral bleaching that has had killed off all of these iconic branching elkhorn corals that gave structure to the reef. So when I wanted to rephotograph, we went out to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla and worked with Dr. Stuart Sandin and his PhD student there on the left, uh, Clint Edwards. And the idea was to find these stakes again. Now I'm going to show you a video of this. It'll be a bit jumpy because of bandwidth, but I'll narrate you through. We were looking for that hole in the donut with that one coral and the stake and we found it. We found all of our stations and there it is. So the idea was to put up a, um, a flotation system and have the new digital, not film camera systems, the digital camera systems move in on the same spot to see how things had changed. And what you're going to see is we swim with this digital stereo camera back and forth in a lawnmower pattern back and forth across the reef. But you'll see as we turn the corner, the diver turns, not the camera, 
because we want to give the computer that will analyze these images as much information as possible. And there, as you swim forward, we see for the first time in 20 years, Elkhorn coral is coming back. Some of those colonies seem to be resistant to the high temperatures of climate change. Here's the digital reconstruction. We're swimming down onto the coral reef. That little white square at the bottom is a scale bar that helps the computer register the image. And right there in the dead center is the living Elkhorn coral that we have not seen on that reef for 20 years. This is an amazing discovery and it's really important because it means that corals can adapt to some level of climate change. And the, what we're so worried about is that by 2060, we will pass the threshold above which coral reefs cannot live. And if you look in the upper left-hand part of the screen, we're worried that coral reefs will turn from their vibrant colors to stark white. But the message of all of these films and of what we're doing today on this virtual teleconference is this, that there is hope. If we were to implement the Paris Climate Accords, that temperature will go down and we can buy coral reefs 100 years, within which time we can hope that corals will evolve resistance to these higher temperatures. But that's not pie in the sky optimism. We have already seen it in Jamaica. Life has the capacity to adapt. We need to give life time. And so I'm gonna stick a smiley face on that if you don't mind. Okay, the most amazing discovery of the return to Jamaica was not in shallow water, but in deep water at 150 feet. This is what it looked like before 10 years later now in deep water. It's the same, almost no difference. The only thing that's happened is that white sponge in the middle has grown. So there we'll go back. It wasn't there before. And then 10 years later, it was. So that's nothing like the complete destruction we saw in 25 feet before and after over the same time period. Now, let me draw your attention to this coral in the center top with a red uh, line around it. And we're going to see that now, same coral specimen on the side. It's deep water, little light. This coral only grows at 0.2 millimeters per year. 0.2 millimeters per year. And this is, is two meters in diameter, which means that coral is 4,000 years old. Now that's the time frame over which human beings can get a grip on climate change and the planet can come back to being a hospitable place to live. Deep reefs may be the coral nurseries to reseed the shallow ocean if we can take care of the planet. I'm gonna stick a smiley face on that too. We can make a difference. Thank you for listening. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so that's a brilliant point at which to, to end the panel and open to questions. And one of the first questions was from somebody who was asking about um, reef restoration. Um, Tara, I know that Reef Watch is doing some pioneering work in India on reef restoration. So can you just tell us what it means to try and restore a reef and how you go about doing that? I mean, quickly, but you know. Yeah, um, <laughs> so I guess very quickly, uh, Reef restoration is, is kind of, you know, uh, similar to, I guess, replanting forests in a sense. Uh, so what we're looking to do is, uh, so a coral reef when it, uh, or a piece of coral when it breaks away, because as I mentioned earlier, they're made up of these individual coral animals, polyps, um, that share the same DNA uh, and together make this coral colony. So what happens is when a piece of a coral breaks off, unlike humans, so if, if my arm broke off, you couldn't grow a new me with that arm, but with corals, you can. So when a piece of them breaks break off, you can, uh, you can get them to start growing and create that same co coral colony again. So what we do is because a lot of the stressors in the Andamans are uh, you know, physical uh, stressors such as anchor damage, or as I mentioned before, jet skis, or, you know, things that break corals. What we do is we collect those pieces of broken coral, and then we kind of transplant them onto this, uh, like a metal structure, 
-hmm. that we think not far away from the natural reef so just as a kind of extension of the natural reef um and uh, you know and we're trying to i i did notice in that question that the person had asked something about you know how do coral restoration efforts help uh, you know in the context of of rising uh, temperatures. So one of the things that we are uh, looking at, one of the things we're experimenting with is uh, this uh, technology that, and I noticed in Chasing Coral, the, the pioneer of that technology was, uh, you know, part of the team uh, where, you know, we're looking at bio rocks. So we're looking to see whether if you, you know, give that coral a little bit of uh, electricity, can you help it grow faster? And what they've noticed is that is that you can because it makes it much easier for the corals to create this calcium carbonate, which I, as I mentioned before, it's really energy intensive. And when they can do that easier, just like us, when we have more energy left over from our usual activities, we're more able to fight off any sort of uh, threats, any sort of passing diseases or any sort of, you know, like a, a fever. We can fight that fever off when we have this extra energy. And that is what we're helping, hoping to equip, uh, you know, these corals with. Um, and uh, as well as that, like, like uh, you know, uh, Dr. Porter mentioned that, you know, there, there seem to be some corals that are more resilient. They seem to have grown bigger, which clearly suggests that they've lived despite these um, disturbances. We also have to place corals in, in a, some sort of evolutionary context. They have been around for, I think, about 400 million years. Um, so, you know, a lot longer than human beings. They've survived huge extinction events, including when the dinosaurs went extinct. And so, uh, so if we can sort of help with some of the stressors, I believe that, you know, they have a natural resiliency also, which can um, come into play. So another thing we're doing is to see if we can collect spawn of uh, different coral colonies, but colonies that have grown really big and so therefore are, um, you know, are clearly more resistant to all these changes that have happened over time and see if we can fertilize those to make just genetically more resilient corals. So th these are all some of the, and then there are many, many other techniques of, of restoration that are being looked at around the world, but these are two that uh, that we specifically are looking at um, at ReefWatch. Sorry to go on. No, that's brilliant. And um, I think it's so great to like balance the message that corals are incredibly threatened and very fragile. I mean, we don't really use the word fragile in ecology, but you know that it's all a very finely tuned system, but then they are resilient as well. Um, and there are things that we can do. So it's not like if we're locked into a certain amount of global heating, there are still things that we need to do to increase the resilience of reefs. It's not just a lost cause. Um, I think we've got about five more minutes for, for questions. Um, I did have, there, there's a theme in a couple of questions, which is about what can citizens um, do to help corals? And then there was another question about what policy changes are are needed. So again, if I can just focus a little bit on um, Jim and Tara, do you, can you talk a little bit about uh, what actions from people and from governments you'd like to see? Your, your voice is the most powerful thing you have. Speak out, speak up, and demand change. Now, I used to tell my students that what they needed to do was to vote. I don't do that anymore. I say run for office. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think that's that's a really uh, a good point. Um, and I think also, uh, you know, a, on a very individual level, and, and I genuinely do think that this makes a difference, that each one of us can make a difference. And that is, I mean, we've mentioned that coral bleaching is, uh, you know, one of the greatest sort of global threats to coral reefs. Um, you know, Dr. Porter has uh, shown us those those climate graphs, and there's stuff that each one of us can do to increase to stop that graph from from rising like that. So, you know, reduce your carbon consumption. It makes a huge difference. Like carpool as much as possible. Use public transport. Cycle. Walk. Um, turn off lights in your house when you, so all these things that I think like, especially growing up in India, all our parents always told us, you know, don't leave the geezer on, don't. <laughs> 
I mean, I think it's really important to kind of stick to those things and, you know, to not forget that, yes, we have a, uh, you know, we have a local level responsibility. So what kind of seafood we uh, consume, how sustainably it is fished, are we aware of it? Um, but also a larger sort of responsibility towards also stopping those big trends and not not just saying that oh you know let's let's let the governments deal with that because the governments are not going to deal with anything that we are not passionate about and that we are not dealing with that's a great point um and i kind of wondered you know um I mean, we haven't mentioned coronavirus once for one hour, <laughs> which is the longest I've gone not talking about COVID for the last four months. Um, but um, I don't think we can avoid it completely. I, um, the, I just wondered, um, Priya, you would like to say something about the impact of the lockdown on the Gulf of Monarch, do you want to give us an update on what's happening? Yeah, I have been uh, following a lot of activities happening in Great, Great Barrier Reef, and I was constantly asking the researchers who are working in, in Gulf of Manar Coast, what is the impact of lockdown? Uh, is it anything uh, differing there? And uh, they shared a research last week, uh, which was quite fascinating. So, like we mentioned, like we, we spoke a lot about uh, coral bleaching. And in Gulf of Manar, generally the bleaching happens and uh, the, the bleaching stays for August and till August the temperature is really high and then actually uh, the corals try to recover. Mm -hmm. uh, so now that number of months and number of days of a uh, high temperature is increasing, the more the death and more mortality. But this year, because of the lockdown and less industrial activities in that coast, uh, scientists said that uh, the recovery started in June. So imagine like a recovery which happens in August got shifted to June. So they are claiming this year the mortality in that coast will be zero. So that is actually showing the real evidence that, you know, uh, we just have to give space for the earth to recover. Yeah. It has that ability. And uh, we just have to accept that, you know, it's not this earth doesn't just belong to us. You know, if we just yeah. accept that and make small changes in our life, and uh, that can create a huge impact. Yeah, maybe that's, that's really down info is just, yeah, adding to that. That's, that's really fascinating. Um, I'm going to just draw it to a close uh, now. Um, Marie and Kunal are going to um, add a couple of comments and they'll also highlight where you can get more information about both the films. Um, before I um, stop jabbering, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to all the panelists. There's so much to say about both the films. There's, there would never have been like enough like time to get through both of them. Um, they're both profoundly brilliant, beautiful, inspiring films. So if you haven't seen either, I really invite you to. Um, and I'm going to hand over um, to Kunal and Marie. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. That was amazing and you're right. There's so many more uh, questions to ask and discussions to be had. And I think both films that were featured and which you can watch as well, um, following the link later on, Coral Woman will be available for free and um, Chasing Coral is available on Netflix. And both of them, I think they're prime examples of what nature documentaries need to be like. Um, they have an amazing narrative and are, are incredibly engaging. Um, so yeah, blown away. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to add to that. That was, that was excellent. And you know, I'm, I'm a dive master myself. And, but there was, you know, you observe so many things, but to get all that amazing information and the science behind um, these reef ecosystems um, is really great. Um, and thank you. Thank you for all the panelists for joining us today. Um, and, and the wonderful Zareen for moderating. Thank you. Um, I, I want to uh, just highlight again that the film festival that's going to take place in on the 5th and 6th of uh, December, uh, right here in Panchkani. We are still accepting film submissions for that. Um, you can do that via our Film Freeway platform. And we are taking submissions till the 15th of September. So any of the viewers out there, your filmmakers, or you know, you have friends who are filmmakers, uh, feel free to go, uh, go and check out our website. And there's further information there. We have five award categories. So yeah, if your film fits in the theme of the environment, we would love for you to make a submission. 
Yes, for sure. And to stay on top of all of that, you can follow us on social media. So you can check out Instagram. We're at alt.f. So that's at alt.eff. And Facebook at All Living Things Festival. And we've got a lot of events coming up. Uh, we, the pandemic was briefly mentioned. There are lots of things you can engage with from your sofa or wherever you're situated. And our official festival is in December. So in the coming months, there are different, all different sorts of events. We had one on snake awareness the other day, which was pretty cool. Um, just check out the socials and also www.altf.in. So for India at the end there. If you have any ideas on what we can do better or just things we can do, or you want to partner with us, you can also met message us at partnerships at altf.in. So again, always all living things, ALT, Environmental Film Festival, EFF. But we'll post that again for you in the Zoom and the YouTube chat as well. Um, I want to close off with uh, an official thank you to our uh, a very dedicated volunteer team, which is Nehan, Chakshu, Francesca, Kushla, Aparna, Devanch, and Zareen, uh, Poonam, and also our other two co-founders, Design Extraordinaires from Network of Creative Thinkers, where I'm sitting at right now, Rudranch and Neha. Thank you guys, and you're, you're, you're really the ones who are making all of this happen. So, um, and finally, um, you know, I want to thank all of you for attending this special event, all of the attendees out there. We've We've clocked uh, definitely over a hundred at some point um, and more to come. Um, and you will all shortly be sent a link to watch the award-winning award film Chasing, uh, I mean, Coral Woman. And if you're watching from YouTube live and you did not register for the event, uh, you may simply go to the Coral Woman website, uh, which is www.coralwoman.com and the full film will be available to watch until midnight tomorrow. So yeah, enjoy the film. It's a really great one. And um, thank you all. And thank you, the panelists. And um, this is a goodbye. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Bye. everyone.